I was born on September the 5th, 1959, in Dothan, Alabama, the old Moody Hospital in Dothan. It doesn't exist anymore. I spent the first 12 years of my life growing up in a little cinder block home on Moat Street 608, Moat Street, Dothan, Alabama. Still remember my phone number. Had to learn all of that to go to kindergarten, you know. I, uh, I lived on a, a street that actually was a, a dead-end street. Now, today we're a little more sophisticated. We would call it a cul-de-sac. We, nobody knew what a cul-de-sac was. There's a little dirt place where you could turn around at the end of the street. It was a good place to grow up. Next door to us, O.D. and Louise Baxley lived with their son. Next door to them were the Brackens. Across the street from the Brackens, my grandmother lived. That was handy, very handy. Next door to my grandmother and directly across the street from us, the Covingtons lived. To the left of our home, up the street, we would say, L.A. and Lethia Thompson lived, and next door to them, the Wyndhams lived. You don't know any of those folks, that's okay. I'll tell you something about that little street, that neighborhood where I lived. To the best of my knowledge, everybody on my street believed in God. Everybody. And up and down that street, all the little kids that played, most of them were at my house. We were six at our house. Up and down that street, and in all of those homes, not only did everybody believe in God, but everybody believed that the Bible is the Word of God. And everybody on my street believed that Jesus is the Son of God. And I'll tell you something about our little dead-end street in Dothan, Alabama, in the late 1950s and early 1960s. On Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, there were a lot of cars pulling out of the driveway, not just ours. I grew up in a time when everybody I knew not only believed in God, believed in the Bible as the Word of God, they they all belonged to a church of some description. I, I went to a little public elementary school where our school day began with a Bible reading the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag, and, don't say this, a prayer. And I'll tell you something else. When it was time to go to lunch, we, we did something else that was unheard of. You're probably thinking that we had a prayer. We did, but we actually lined up single file in line to go to lunch. And we walked down the hall in a single file line. And I'll tell you, if anybody got out of line, any teacher standing in her doorway along the way was apt to thump you on the head. On 
All of my friends had a mom and a dad who were married to each other and who lived in the same house with them. I was in junior high school before I had a friend whose parental situation was different than that. And I say all of that to you this morning to say to you that we're not living in Mayberry anymore, folks. Our children are growing up in a culture that is remarkably different from the culture in which many of us were raised. I mean remarkably different. There have been a lot of changes in things, changes in education, changes in government, changes in values, changes in family structure, changes in technology. But I, I will tell you this from a moral and spiritual perspective, a lot of that change has not been for the better. Oh, we may think we've come a long way. If we're measuring distance, we've come a long way. If you're looking at direction, it ought to scare us to death. We, we, we grew up in a culture, many of us, we started out in a culture that looks something like this. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I'm saying to you that it wasn't that many years ago that that's where we started. And I'll tell you where we're ending up. We're ending up right here. Although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful. They became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise they became fools. Ladies and gentlemen, who ever thought that in our lifetime we would become so sophisticated in this country that we couldn't even figure out which restroom to use in public? Who ever thought that our children would grow up in a world where in their public schools that there, there is no longer going to be gender specificity. What has happened to us? And how is that impacting our reality in talking to people around us about Jesus Christ and in trying to teach the gospel of Christ in the culture in which we are living? I'll say this to every dad and mom here. Our children and our grandchildren are going to be challenged to answer some hard questions. I mean challenged in ways at an early age that you and I were not challenged. I'm not telling you when I was growing up that everybody did what was right that everybody believed exactly the right doctrinal truth and they all worshipped exactly the right. I'm not telling you that. I am telling you there was a general understanding that some things were right, they are always right, and everyone was held to the standard of right. And there were some things wrong that were always wrong and everyone was held accountable for wrong. And I'm telling you folks, that's not where we are anymore. Not everybody on the street where I grew up believed the same doctrinal truths about the Bible that I would adhere to. But I'll tell you this, nobody on my street ever tried to tell me that the Bible is not God's Word. And nobody on my street where I was growing up ever tried to convince me that Jesus is not really God. Nobody. Our children are being challenged in ways at an early age that you and I never dreamed of. We would have never dreamed of. I don't know if you know Dr. Ehrman or not. It's just fine with me if you don't. 
He is an American New Testament scholar, currently the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. According to the Journal of Evangelical Theological Society, he is one of North America's leading scholars in his field, having written and edited 27 books, including three college textbooks, probably more now. He has also achieved acclaim at the popular level, authoring five New York Times bestsellers. Ehrman's work focuses on textual criticism of the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the development of early Christianity. Let me just say to you that early on, this very intellectual man, very scholarly individual, early on, he was a tremendous apologist for the New Testament. But something changed. And for all of his vast knowledge of the manuscripts and the text and the languages, he now would refer him to himself as an agnostic atheist. He's written a number of books, one of them entitled Jesus Interrupted, Revealing the Hidden Contradictions in the Bible. And uh, on page 19 of his introduction, he says, when students are first introduced to the historical, as opposed to a devotional study of the Bible, one of the first things they are forced to grapple with is that the biblical text, whether Old Testament or New Testament, listen to this, is chock full of discrepancies, many of them irreconcilable. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's a heavy statement coming from a distinguished professor of New Testament documents. Really? The New Testament is chock full of discrepancies, irreconcilable, Really? And so he begins to tell us we don't have the originals of any book of the New Testament. Now I'm about to make a list of things that he says in trying to challenge all of those little people who still believe in the book. The good book. But of all the things I'm going to put on the list, I, I will say to you, we'll come back to this later in our study, in our studies this week. This first point is right. We don't have the originals of any book of the New Testament. That's right, but what, what does that mean? That, don't, don't read too much into that. He said, scribes intentionally altered the manuscripts. So that now, today, so that we cannot know what the original authors wrote. He said, the authors of the books are not who we think they are. Well, he, he didn't ask me who I thought they were. But he said, they're not who we think they are. And he alleges that at least 19 of the 27 books of the New Testament are forgeries. That the Bible is full of of contradictions, that it's anti-intellectual, that it's unscientific. Ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's heavy stuff. That's heavy stuff leveled against what we regard as the fundamental source of authority for what we teach and practice as New Testament Christians. And this is coming from a man who is the James A. Gray Distinguished Scholar of New Testament? This is supposed to be somebody who knows. Is this true, what he's saying? Is the Bible just a book of forgeries? Or 
is it full of contradict chock full of contradictions that many of which are irreconcilable are are these claims true can we trust the bible that's the question can we trust the bible can we trust the author of the bible because ladies and gentlemen listen to me carefully those two questions are irrefutably connected don't think for one minute we're going to talk about postmodernism and emergent church stuff later Folks that are playing fast and loose with the concept of truth. But I want to say this to you right now, and I want us to get this firmly established. Don't think that you can be loosey-goosey with the text, that you can trash the biblical text and still maintain an attitude of reverence and respect for the God who authored it. Don't, don't think that. I'm telling you right now, your trust in this book and your trust in the author of the book, those things stand or fall together. They stand or fall together. And we can, we can pretend, because it's more comfortable, that you know, these, are, these are questions and, and noises that are being made by those unbelievers in, the, in, those, in those secular institutions. Okay. But listen to me. Our children and our grandchildren are going to be challenged to answer some hard questions about what they believe and why they believe it. And at the end of the day, this has everything to do with all of the social issues that we're facing in our culture, including the confusion about gender specificity. It is sobering that we spend thousands and thousands of dollars to send our children into an academic world that is filled with unbelievers. And I'll tell you something, we send them into that world, either they are grounded in the truth or we're sending them into that world, paying other people to destroy their faith. We need to wake up to that. Richard Levin, the president of Yale University, in a freshman address to the incoming class of 2011, they would have been the graduates of the class of 2016 this past spring. He told the students in that introductory address, in that assembly, they needed to be clear about the questions that really matter. What constitutes a good life? What kind of life do you want to lead? What kind of values do you hope to live by? It, it, it is true, he said, that your professors are unlikely to give you the answers to questions about what you should value and how you should live, we, we leave those answers up to you. Really? He just said they needed to be clear about these questions. And then he said, it's unlikely that your professors are going to give you the answer to the what given given the state of affairs it's probably a good thing those professors aren't giving the answers to the question I fear however they're influencing the answers to those questions in the postmodern thinking of the emergent church uh, that we're seeing today every person has his own truth every person finds his own truth within himself that is absolutely and diametrically opposed to what Jeremiah testified to many years ago when he said, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. 
I'm saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, even places like Harvard and Yale do not have the answers to the questions that really matter. They can teach you the elements of the periodic table. They can give you the equation for determining the velocity of an object. That's not left up to you. They believe there is an objective truth about the uh, equation for determining the velocity of an object. They will pass you or fail you. De determined by whether or not you give the correct answer to that question. But on other questions, whereas they would assume that the elements of the periodic table are the formula for uh, determining the velocity of an object, those are questions of knowledge. They would assume that these other questions are questions not based on knowledge. There's a time for real Christians, real Christians, to ask hard questions. I, I want to say something to you, ladies and gentlemen. Truth has nothing to hide. Don't ever feel like that you have to retreat, that you have to run and hide behind a tree, that, that you have to hang your head. Tr truth has nothing to hide. Don't lose your balance. Focus on what you know and ask about what you don't know. Barna Research revealed some troubling news just recently when they said 36% of young Christians said that they were embarrassed or they were unable to ask the most serious faith questions that they had. Ladies and gentlemen, asking questions is not wrong. Having questions is not wrong. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, the Lord said to his people through the prophet, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Few people, few people just jump off a cliff with their faith. I mean, it's not like they were believers one day and the next day they woke up and said, You know what? I think... Beginning now, I, I'm just not going to believe in God anymore. That, that's not generally how it happens. It usually happens one step at a time. You're sitting in a botany class, and some professor is absolutely ridiculing those students who raised their hand when he said, Does anybody in here still believe that God created the world? Someone dared to raise their hand and the professor just went crazy. And the Christian sitting there in his mind and his heart, he lets go of the creation account, telling himself, you know, it really doesn't matter how the world got here. I still believe in God. And then the question about this worldwide flood comes up. Oh, what a joke that was. Well, uh, you know, you, you can still believe in God and not believe in creation and the flood. Uh, there are other explanations for, for, for all of that. And, and then, you, you know, th this history of the Jews, of Israel, I mean, there, there's some things in their past. It's just embarrassing. And then, uh, you know, okay, they, they believe in G Jesus. Jesus. But... The virgin birth, the miracles, the, the physical, literal resurrection from the dead. You know, I, I still believe that God, for Christ's sake, he's, he's saving me. Secretly, they still long for heaven, but they don't talk about it too much anymore. Because somebody may ask them about the other place. And you know, nobody believes in the other place anymore. Year by year, issue by issue, doctrine by doctrine, they let go of one thing at a time. And they wake up one day, and there's nothing left to believe in. Parents, our children need to know that it is entirely reasonable to believe that the Bible is the Word of God. 
Christianity is not a fairy tale for grown-up kids. But be sure about some things. The world is not going to teach your child the truth about the Bible. The world is not going to reinforce your child's faith in the Bible. But the world will challenge your child's belief in the Bible. You can be sure about that. Is the Bible a, a book for uneducated, for uninformed fools? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 he said, as he was writing to a group of Christians who were situated, situated right in the citadel of Greek sophistry, these people who have surrounded themselves in the ivory palaces of the thinkers of their day, and they were so sure of their educational status. And Paul said, I want to tell you something. Seeing that in the wisdom of God, the world through his wisdom did not know God, it was God's good pleasure through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The Jews ask for signs. The Greeks seek after wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto Gentiles foolishness, but unto them that are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. Is the Bible for fools? In the eyes of the world, the Bible is for fools. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we better be very careful about teaching our children to glory in the respect and the acceptance of this world in which we live. I'm going to say that again. We need to be very careful about teaching our children to glory in the respect and the acceptance of this world in which we live. If that becomes their objective, our children will of necessity abandon the gospel. Our God is a rational God who created us in his own image. And because our God is a rational God who created us in his image, we are rational beings. Today's culture exalts emotion. Everybody is talking about how they feel. Today's culture exalts emotion and devalues reason. Today's culture is all about seeing. Boy, we are the imagery culture. Imagery is everything. We're all about seeing, we're all about feelings, about emotions. God created us to hear the word and to reason, to think with the mind. Today's culture is all about sound bites and slogans and quick updates. God is all about thoughtful reasoning and meditation day and night. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Did you get that? He doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He does not stand in the way of sinners. He does not sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law he doth what? meditate day and night and night God created us to think and to reason it's not a 15 or 20 second sound bite that some media organization picks up and plays over and over again trying to create a concept that is imbalanced or untrue it takes time to reflect. It takes time to meditate. That's why the psalmist said day 
and night. It takes time to think and reason. And ladies and gentlemen, to that extent, because it does take time to think, to that extent, our culture is working against us. You, you have a lot of time this week? Did any of you this morning say anything about being rushed for time even today? About how busy today is? About how much we have to do? About how much time we have? About what's happening this week and how much time is going to be? Our culture conditions us to not take time. And to that extent, we become mentally lazy. And to that extent, we permit others to think for us. And so we have these paid professionals who pipe information through what they call news channels. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they are telling us what they think we need to be thinking. And our culture conditions us to mindlessly go along. We, we remember years ago a generation that was more like the little house on the prairie. And today we've become the little house on the freeway. Zipping along 70 miles an hour trying to get to that next appointment. We live in a culture that exalts the trivial and dismisses the meaningful. Ladies and gentlemen, in our study this week, we're going to talk about attitudes toward the Bible. Cultural attitudes toward the Bible were not formed in a vacuum. The reason that we have a coming generation that has some very different attitudes about God, about worship, about truth, about morality, about gender. The reason that we have a coming generation that has some very different attitudes about those things is because they have some very different attitudes about this book. And part of that is the result, wittingly or unwittingly, of a concession of some of our generation to simply not address or to give in, surrender, on some of the most fundamental challenges to the Bible. In our next lesson, we're going to talk about Christianity is not a fairy tale. This, this reality in which we are engaged is, is not something once upon a time in a faraway land, there, there's this story that somebody told to make us better people. Bless our little hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, Christianity is not a bless your little heart thing. We're talking about something that is based on historical documents that have evidence that they are exactly what they claim to be. And the faith of our children will stand or fall in part on whether or not they grasp that truth. This is an important study. These are important concepts. And I'm delighted this week to have the opportunity to spend this time with you and looking at these things together. If you're here this morning and not a Christian, what a wonderful opportunity today to come in obedience to the gospel. If you believe in your heart of hearts that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God who died for our sins and you're ready to put on the Lord in baptism, you can do that this morning. 
And if it gathered in this assembly this morning, there are Christians, someone whose life with the Lord is not where it ought to be, and you are ready to come home, we pray today will be the day that you will come back to the Lord. While we stand and sing, we invite you to come.